Yeah, guys, it's become a time to worship now. You know, one of the things I've really been enjoying last Sunday, being able to be back in the church surrounding and have, um, have people there, have the family back on board. That was a really great, a really good joy and a really good uh, time again, being able to fellowship and, and sing to the Lord uh, with the church family. So having said that, you know, praising our God and singing to him is not something that we need to be doing in a church. We can be doing that. Uh, anywhere in the car, anytime in the home. So once again, if you are at home watching this this morning, I'm going to encourage you just to really sit back in your lounge and enjoy, and just really enjoy praising our God. And, and I believe we've got a lot to be praising Him for at the moment with restrictions easing, uh, with more freedoms and more liberties coming back to us. It's a great time to thank Him and to really sing to Him and really embrace praising our Lord and our Saviour with the song and, and out of our hearts. So this morning, enjoy the worship. The songs have been put there for you. So get your hands in the air, uh, sing along, and really let yourself praise the Lord with your heart and with your mind and with your soul. And I'll see you on the other side of the worship.
passion, a love that's never been. But let mercy fall on me. For everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, the hope of nations.
is uh, with us today so as we come around the communion table a time of celebrating in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us so to me I find it very an important part of my life to be able to break bread with him to be able to give thanks to him for what he's done and I guess for me 
you know, when I come around the Lord's table, the one of the things that, that really, I guess, is the centerpiece for me is the forgiveness of my sin. You know, when Jesus broke bread and took the cup, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And I, and I thank him um, all the time, but specifically when I break bread, that through his blood and through his sacrifice on the cross, the forgiveness of my sin was paid for in full. So this morning, have your biscuit ready and your cup ready as Andrea Roberts brings us around the communion table and really sit back and, and just enjoy in your own heart, reflecting and remembering what he's done for you. And I'll see you at the end of the communion message. From Luke 22, verses 19 to 20 to start with. And I'm reading for, oops, I'll that I'm reading from the New Living Translation. So Luke 22, 19 and 20. And it hopefully, well actually maybe I'll just read it off there. So, it's so it says, He is in Jesus. Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Next verse. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Okay. So Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And shortly after this statement, Jesus suffered and died a painful death on the cross. So I have a question for us all, and there's going to be two questions. The first one is, what has Jesus' death on the cross meant for you? And we'll talk about his resurrection in a minute. So firstly, what did that suffering, that horrible death that Jesus died for you on the cross, what has that meant for you? And feel free to respond. Get rid of the torment. Get rid of the torment. Awesome. Something else. It means I need to forgive like he, he's forgiven me. So whether that's Black Lives Matter, whatever injustice, I've got to forgive. Yep, so God's forgiveness, Jesus' forgiveness. Righteousness that is ours and it's a gift from God. Yeah. So righteousness from, that is a gift from God and not something that we earn. Fantastic. Someone else? He's forgiven all our sins. He's forgiven all our sins. What else did Jesus' death on the cross do for you? Or mean to you? What are we remembering today? That death. Which was horrible. And we sang about it in that song, didn't we? Healing through the broken body. Healing through his broken body. And that was something that uh, the Holy Spirit said to me. You know, this week when I've been not that well, I've actually not had a great week health-wise, and I kept being reminded, my blood, Jesus said, my blood was poured out that you would be healed, that you would be set free from that sickness. And then as I prayed, and then, you know, the healing didn't always come straight away, but it came. Something else? Mm -hmm. We're not used to, like... Interaction? Restoration. Restoration. Thanks, Marilyn. Someone else? Freedom. Freedom. <laughs> we talked about that this morning, didn't we? Freedom. Okay, so they are all the things we're remembering today about Jesus' death on the cross. What about Jesus' resurrection? Mm. So specifically, because if Jesus just died for us, I mean, all well and good, but remember our Christian faith, we are the only ones that believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Without Jesus' resurrection... There is not that power. It's we literally just die and we're, that's it. So the power is in the resurrection. So for you today, what is it that um, you're remembering about Jesus' resurrection from the cross or from death? The Holy Spirit? Yep, that's right. So as Jesus died, the Holy Spirit was able to come and be with us. Knowledge. Knowledge of? Knowledge of the Holy Spirit, right? Eternal life. Hope. Hope. Eternal life. Took us a while to get to that one. Isn't that the most amazing promise that we have? Because Jesus rose again, we have eternal life. That if we were to walk out this building today and get hit by a car and... <laughs> bit grim. But it could happen. Let's hope it doesn't. But when we have faith in Jesus and the resurrection from the cross, we know where we are going. If we have confessed that faith, if in our heart, openly, then we know where we're going. And that hope 
of eternal life is something that I was thinking about. All right. Anything else? Jesus reigns supreme. Yeah, so because he rose again, he now reigns supreme. So because Jesus rose from, rose from the death and was justified, so too are we, when we have faith in him, we are also justified by faith. Awesome. So hopefully this morning we've remembered Jesus' death and resurrection and what that means for us. So we're going to eat together now the wafer or bread or cracker, if you like me, whatever you've got. And this represents, just like Jesus we read, um, this represents his body that was broken for us. So let's just pray before we eat. Lord God, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. We thank you that because you died on that cross and you rose again, we can be free. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. take the cup, which is the juice that represents Jesus' blood. So let's just pray before we drink together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your blood that was shed on the cross. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sin through faith in you. Lord, as we drink this today, we remember the sacrifice that you made for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Alright, thanks for sharing your communion with us today. Yeah, so we come again to uh, the time of the service that many of you that have been following us online have been quite familiar with. You know, I've been really enjoying just listening to Billy Graham and others uh, just for some motivational speeches, just some little extracts of their messages. Well, during the week I sat down and, and I was having a, a listen to Reinhard Bonnke and I really am really inspired by some of the views that Reinhard Bonnke has and particularly in the love, you know, the love for God and God's love for us. So this morning I came across this clip during the week, so we're going to play that one this morning. It's from Reinhard Bonnke and it simply stated, I am with you always. And let it be a remembrance to us and a reminder to us that he never leaves us, he never forsakes us, he is with us every day of our life forever. So sit back, enjoy and be inspired by Reinhard Bonnke's thoughts um, and let him penetrate, let him penetrate your heart and your soul that Jesus is with you always, no matter what's going on. And I'll be back for the message following. third one was and was that that I was taught when we go to church we must always pray dear Lord Jesus please come into our midst come into our midst oh I prayed so much Lord Jesus please come into our midst come please please why don't you come come Half my life I prayed like that. One day I read Matthew 28, verse 20, and I gasped. The Holy Spirit was there. He taught me something. Jesus said, I am with you. myself wait a minute only somebody not right in his mind is begging somebody to come who never leaves you he never leaves us I am with you always how long is always forever hallelujah 
I am with you always. I say, Jesus, I want to thank you. You are with me even when I don't feel like it. You are with me always. That changed everything in my life. I, half of the, the hymns I could no more sing, but it didn't matter. You know, that is the Christian's only certainty that so many Christians are not certain about. That Jesus is with us always. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. He's with me. He's with me. I heard somebody tell how, how, how he was in a crusade and then he was to mount the platform to, to preach him. And he wouldn't come up the platform because he said he couldn't feel the presence of Jesus couldn't feel it and he st stood there crying tears saying Lord be with me I can't go up if I don't know you don't feel you are with me Lord oh, man, I respect that preacher but I don't agree with him you know you know what struck me you know Jesus is not a commodity he is a personality. He is a personality like you, like you, and like me. And no personality appears in percentages. You are here fully. I am here fully. And so is Jesus. fully ha, that got me going I tell you it spun it, it stopped me it spun me around and it turned me and I moved in a new direction Jesus is with me always and if I don't feel his presence then I know my feelings are lying. Because the word of God says the opposite. Hallelujah. The word of God states it. And if I don't feel him, I sometimes have a... When I'm in Africa, I tell you, when I had to preach and I was glowing with fever, with malaria... I didn't feel Jesus exactly, you know what I mean. I took the microphone and I put it away and I said, Lord Jesus, I don't feel you right now, but I appropriate your presence by faith. And then I preached and I tell you, people got saved in huge numbers and the sick got healed and the lame walked and the blind saw. Jesus is with us. Hallelujah. May it affect you as it affected me. This is the, the cry of my heart and my desire. Indeed. Hallelujah. Jesus is always with us. Amen. I was talking on freedom this morning. You know, it's amazing, you know, when you listen to somebody else talk and their, you know, view on things or their way of putting things. It was funny when the Lord was just sitting there with me. And I like the one our donkey thing is with you always, by the way. I do like that. 
I think that's something we all need to appreciate and learn. But I was sitting there when, when Andrea was saying, you know, what is it you remember? And I always jump straight to the forgiveness. So we're going to talk on some forgiveness today. But what tends to happen with me is God tends to speak to me about forgiveness in different ways. And I hope that makes sense to you all. And one of the things that I'm grateful for is when he came out of the tomb, he gave me the right to come out of the tomb. And I don't know if you all understand what I just said. When he said eternal life, when he said, if you believe in me, you shall no longer live in darkness and die either even though we die physically. He's given us life and life ever, ever, ever lasting. So one of the revelations I had, so thank you for that, Andrew, is I actually, um, he spoke to me about when the tomb rolled away from, for him, the tomb rolled away for me, that I too can come out of that tomb. So I just wanted to encourage us with that. So this morning we're going to chat about forgiveness. So how many of you know how much forgiveness is actually talked about in the Bible? It's actually talked about quite a lot. And for me, during the weeks, everybody's aware of what's going on in the universe at the moment. Yeah. Uh, everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got a point of view. I am deliberately staying off of it this morning. All right? So I'm not, I don't want to get caught up in all the stuff that's going on around the world. Because right now, how many of us have got caught up in our own stuff? And I think there's a lot of stuff going on with individuals that I think God wants to move on. So when I was looking at the forgiveness, forgiveness is spoken about from two different points of view consistently through the Bible. One of the things, and I'll try and stay still, Emma, yes, I know. One of the things that, that he's talked about, Jesus said, repent. So that's the forgiveness coming this way. You all got that? That's when you ask God to forgive you. You all got that? That's the repentance of sin. The second way forgiveness takes place is when forgiveness goes to forgiving somebody else. So the repentance is when forgiveness, when you ask Jesus to forgive you, and then the forgiveness that comes from you out. So most of us are well versed on the forgiveness of Jesus, yeah? Most of us are well versed that he forgives our sin. You all with me on that? How many of us are well versed on the forgiveness of others? It's an area that I hear a lot of people speak on, um, particularly in Christian circles. I hear a lot of people speak on it when there's no pressure on. What happens when there's a bit of pressure on? Do you have any blood pressure? Someone's cut you off at the roundabout, somebody's annoyed you, somebody's blasphemed you, somebody's ticked you off, hasn't done what you want. How many people find it hard to remember that, that second forgiveness, the way of forgiving that way? How many struggle with that in that moment? And I'm no orphan in the room by the sounds of it. So something that God's been really speaking to me about, and that is, is that you know, there's, a, there's a lot of emphasis at the moment on forgiving where people are saying, you have to say sorry. Well, I've got a question for all of you. What about the sorry that we have to say? I'm just going to put it out there for you. So when I was searching the scriptures, one of the things that spoke to me is I have the wonderful privilege of going into Gossip High School. Uh, caught up with you twice this, this week, young Han Lee, bumped into you twice. One of the things you get to see is you go into the school and you get to see the kids hold on to grudges. And from my point of view, you get to see some of the things that the kids go through. So one of the things that I'm very blessed in was when I went in there, I said to the Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to treat these children that are... I don't know. I, all I want to say to all the school teachers and to all the SSOs, you all need a medal. The okay, guys, I've been with them. <laughs> and that must be very frustrating, very hard to cope with all day, every day with these kids. So I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to remember what I've done for you. I want you to do for them. Well, that changes things a little bit. So when I went in there, the first thing I said is I want to teach you respect. Because God had to teach me respect. So in a four-week period, or roughly four weeks since I've been able to go back into the school, can I tell you that I've got the boys that are in my, that I'm with, are no longer using extreme swear words. That's going to be pretty cool, doesn't it? What do you think? And I challenged them on Wednesday, I said to them, how about we take it a step further, and whenever there's a female teacher, female SSO in the room, how about we don't swear at all? And they gave me knuckles and said, we'll do that. You notice... Something God had to do was he said to me, you're going to have to look past their shortcomings. 
you're going to have to look past their sin. One of the things that Pastor Cheryl said during the week was the ministry we did together where she said, love the person. Doesn't mean you have to love the sin. I think that's a good point, don't you? So searching through the scriptures, you know, the obvious ones are, Jesus said, unless you can forgive, you know, you'll have no part of me. There's a lot of scriptures in there. But I asked the Lord, I said, so what's some of the stumbling blocks to being able to forgive? And you're all going to say to me, bitterness, anger, all that sort of stuff, racism. Yeah, there's a lot of stumbling blocks. Sorry, what was that? Pride's a stumbling block. Yeah, well done, Flaney. So when I spoke to the Lord about it, he said to me, this will make you laugh, he said to me, ignorance. There you go. Ignorance. How many of us are ignorant to our own sin? Interesting concept, isn't it? So with that, we're going to go to Luke, if you can put the first scripture up. I think it was Luke chapter 7, wasn't it, Andrew? I think I got that right. Verse 39. How many of you know the story of the Pharisee had Jesus come into his house? Invited him in, wanted to have tea with him. And a woman came along. And the woman was of ill repute. Ill repute. <laughs> this woman was of ill repute. Now, so I, there's a couple of points of view here that God was talking to me about. Now, I'm not going to get caught up in the logistics, as I think. But how did the woman get into the Pharisee's house? Well, there you go. She's an unclean person. How did she even get in? Was, was people in the house so focused on Jesus, they didn't even notice that she'd come in? How did she get in? Secondly, how did she get to his feet? Was people too scared to say something in case Jesus rebuked them? Interesting point of view. So the Bible says, so I'm not sure where I'm up in the story, but if I repeat myself, forgive me. But the story talks about that all she did was hear about him. That's all she did. So she's heard about him. She doesn't know him. But what do you think she heard about him? Healings, deliverances, forgiveness of sin. What do you reckon she would have heard? What do you reckon the people were chatting about in the community? Sorry? Yep, yep. So I would think that this woman would have heard about this dude called Jesus because I think he would have been the topic of the conversation in most areas at that time. What drove her to want to get there? What do you reckon drove her to want to get there? I reckon she would have been not so happy with her life. I reckon that's what drove her. I think that she would have been dismayed. I think she would have felt rejected. She would have felt abandoned. She would have been heckled and ridiculed. You think about it, apart from the men that were visiting her, what do you reckon everybody else was saying to her? Remember, she was unclean. Obviously, the men that were visiting her would have been quite nice to her. But the ones that weren't visiting her, what would they have been doing? So let's pick up the story. So I want to... So it says, now, when the Pharisee who had invited him in saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would surely know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a notorious sinner, a social outcast devoted to sin. First thing that stood out to me when I read this scripture, so if you look back, it talks about her coming in as I've explained. So the first thing that God wanted me to see here was, let me ask you something about the Pharisee. Did the Pharisee know Jesus? God was showing me that the Pharisee had actually heard of Jesus, but didn't know him. Because if the Pharisee had known Jesus, he would have known what he was doing with the sinners. So why did the Pharisee invite Jesus in? Social standing? Oh, sorry, what, yeah, what, yeah. Social standing, look good. I want to be seen hanging out with this dude. I believe that there's a number of people, just like this Pharisee, that want to invite Jesus in. That have not got to know him. So you think about this, this Pharisee, this teacher of the law, they would have all understood what was said about the Messiah. Remember Jesus claiming he was the Messiah, the prophet, yeah? So this Pharisee would have looked at Jesus and gone, surely if you're a prophet, surely you would know what this woman's done. Let's go down the next verse, please. And Jesus replying, said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, teacher, Say it. I like the word teacher here. How was the Pharisee seeing Jesus? I think the Pharisee was seeing Jesus no different to any other religious ruler because he said teacher. One of the things that took me by surprise, I would just focus on the Pharisee for a minute. The Pharisee 
didn't, I, I believe this with all my heart, but what God was showing me was he operated out of a religion, out of a religious point of view, not out of a relationship one. So when he says, teacher, notice he didn't say master, notice he didn't say Lord, notice he didn't say saviour, he just simply said teacher. Now, Jesus was a teacher, please don't take me wrong in that. But how do most people see Jesus today? I can ask you a question, do you see him as a Lord? Do you see him as saviour? Do you see him as master? No? Notice I just put all three in one basket. Teacher, Lord, master. What does that imply? A religious man. Or do you see him as friend, brother? Do you see him as father? Now we're talking relationship. This woman must have seen him outside of religious point of view. Because why did she end up in there? Don't you think she was taking a big risk going in there? Don't you think she was taking one big risk rocking up in there because what would have happened to her? Remember the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, remember this, that they weren't allowed to go near nothing unclean. Remember she was unclean. She took a big risk in Jesus rejecting her. Don't you think? Remember it says that she'd heard of him and she's gone running in. I hope you see my point of view here when I talk about the Pharisee, yeah? So let's take the Pharisee and let's take the, 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 the woman, yeah? I don't know if it clearly says in there what the sin is, but I think it's pretty obvious what she's done. Let's go to the next one, please. A certain lender of money at interest had two debtors, one owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Next one, please, Andrew. When they had no means of paying, he freely forgave them both. Now, which one of them will love him more? Before we go any further, and we'll look at it, he's talking to his teacher. Notice he's not addressing the woman. Now, if you read the story, the woman's at his feet, while this is being said, washing his feet with her tears. She brought in an, an expensive vase of jar, alabaster, I think it's called, of perfume. She's anointing him. So she's crying, she's weeping at him, and this is, the, this is Jesus addressing the teacher, addressing the Pharisee. Anybody know what comes next? If you know the story, you know what's coming next. I want to show you something that God pointed out to me. Next one, please, Andrew, and then we'll go back one. Simon answered, the one I take it for whom he forgave and cancelled more, and Jesus said to him, you have decided correctly. I like how he says here, the one I take it. How many of you would think that the person that had the most denarii to the person that had the least denarii would, be, would love more? Which one do you all think? The one with the least. Okay, so let's go back one. Yep. Yep, so let's go back one. When they had no... Yep. Then no, just back to the one that was just up, if that makes sense. Yeah, when they had no means of paying, he freely forgave them both. What's the one word you see? What's the one little sentence you see in there? Yeah. Hang on. Forgave who? Both. Oh, now this is something God was pointing out to me. See, all of us, just like Simon did, Simon came back and said, so let's jump forward again, Andrew. I know I'm jumping around the place a bit. All right? Simon answered the one I take it for whom he forgave and cancelled more. And Jesus said to him, you have decided correctly. If you look at that scripture, and Jesus really took my, me to it, where it said he freely forgave them both. Why didn't Simon answer back, why wouldn't they both love you, Lord? Why did Simon straight away go, well, of course, the one that's got the 500 is going to love you more than the one with the 50? Do you know why Simon went straight to that point? Because I don't think Simon thought he'd actually done that much wrong. I think he thought she was the worst of the crop. I don't think when he was sitting there, he was comparing his sin to hers. I think he was sitting there going, have a look at her. Now let me ask you something. Did not Jesus just say to him, you might think you've only done 50, she's done 500, but I've freely forgiven both of you. What stood out to me is how many of us actually understand when somebody in the community comes to Jesus, he's forgiven just as much as we are. Hmm. The whole point gets interesting to me now because I tend to have a measuring stick. Does anybody else have a measuring stick? Okay. 
The measuring stick I'm going to use is based on me. Okay? So, I've been through certain things in my life that I find absolutely revolting. I am persuaded in that because I have an emotional investment. Does that make sense? Now, somebody else has been through something different and has the same problem. Do you get my point? I want to ask you something right now. Do you believe that you've been forgiven a 50 or 500 yourself? Don't answer. Just speak to yourself. Do you believe that the people out there in the world are greater sinners than you, or do you believe that they're just the same as you? Do you believe that a pedophile does more than a homosexual relationship, more than a murderer, more than a stealer, or do you believe if you gossip, you're just as bad? I don't know. When God was taken to me to this, he said, it's the ignorance, Red. And when I asked him what he meant by ignorance, because it's a strong word, he said to me, I forgave both of them freely. Why are you comparing the debt? You have compared my salvation and my forgiveness to the debt, not to the person. Now, I believe that that's going on in society today. Now, I'm not going to get political on this one, but I want to ask you something. Do you think today that the debt is being compared in our country and around the world or the person? Think what I've just said. What I see in our country right now is debts from years ago still being held accountable. What about the people? Have we lost sight of the people in all of this? We're still bringing up debts from hundreds of years ago. Because we're measuring what the debt is instead of understanding that God has, has forgiven all debt. Now I took that up with God and I said to him, how does that go for me, Lord? And he said to me, well, Red, I want to show you that I don't have an account of debts. How many of you actually know that if you've given your life to him, you are not recorded in the debtors section? You all know that when you're recorded in there, we don't have a one person's debt is bigger than another. Why then as human beings do we behave like Simon? And I'm going to tell you, I see this. Let me tell you how I see this. If that person would just fix their problems, they'll be okay. Well, I don't think if they could fix it, they would have already fixed it. I hear this right now because there's so much argument going on because the moment you concentrate on a debt, you will have an emotional attachment. The moment you have an emotional attachment, you will judge between what debt's bigger than another. <coughs> How are we going with that so far? Getting the point? What took me by surprise, and again I'll repeat it, he said, I freely forgave both debts. So I'm going to say something to you. You may have grown up in the church all your life. You may not have actually done anything wrong. Can I ask you something? Do you think your debt is any less than the most heinous of people? The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What does that mean by all? I've got a question for you. <coughs> if you're happy to, and you think you're part of the all, put your hand up. I'm going to put two up. <laughs> So what that says to me is what God wants us to learn out of the Simon and the woman story is that Simon was looking at her by going, gee, Jesus, if you actually knew what she gets up to, if you knew what she's doing herself, you wouldn't let her touch you, mate. Yet he himself had Jesus in the house. Why did he have Jesus in the house? Let's read the story a bit further. It gets more interesting. Next one. Then turning toward the woman, oh, see, I like this. He's talking to him, now he's talking to her. Notice how he flips. And he says, Simon, do you see this woman? When I came into your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Speaking to Simon, he talks about the denarii, the record of wrong, the debt. Now he turns to the woman. Still talking to Simon. 
but he's looking at the woman. Simon, when I came into your house, you didn't give me anything. May I ask you something? When a person that's unclean comes into you, into your world, into your life, what do you give them? Do you give them nothing? Simon was so busy focused on having Jesus in there. Look at me, I got Jesus. He totally missed the relationship of why he was there. Oh, there's so many of us. I believe this with a passion. that want Jesus in here. But we so miss what he wants us to have in here. We so miss, just like Simon. Simon was so busy focused, he didn't even notice her come in. How many of you have actually noticed what's coming into your own life? How many of us actually take notice to see what's going on inside? Are we Simon in front of Jesus or are we the woman? The woman didn't know him. That's clear. She only heard of him. Yet she came to him, sat down. Now I'm going to ask you a question here. Did she know that Simon hadn't washed his feet? I don't think she knew. I don't think she had any idea as pigs fly. So what did she do? She went there herself. Remember last week we talked about letting Jesus wash our feet? There's some things we have to do on our own. There's some things that we cannot have other people do for us. There's no pastor, there's no preacher, there's no nobody can do. This woman, and I find this funny, remember when we talk about reclining, we weren't, they weren't sitting the way we are, they were like laying on their side. He's fully aware that she's touching him, he's fully aware that it's her hair and her tears. I wonder how Simon's going right now. Oh, forgot that. Oh, better get my religious activities in order. Better get, make sure I'm doing the traditions. Hey, you reckon that would have been his first thought? Didn't even think about, I've got the Son of God, the King of Kings in my house. Who could wash my feet? Ooh, you can see a few people thinking at the minute. <laughs> Let's go to the next one, Andrew. You gave me no kiss, but she from the moment I came in has not ceased intermittently to kiss my feet tenderly and caressingly. caressingly. I want to ask you something. What God was showing me was her love for Jesus did not stop the whole time she was there. She humbled herself. She forgot about who was in the room. She forgot about what the judgments were coming at her. She focused only on him. How many of us in our life, when it comes to forgiveness issues, need to stop focusing on what's in the room and start focusing on Him? You know, I'm watching people get so caught up on bitterness, get caught up on history, get caught up on racism, get caught up on opinions, and yet I'm asking a simple question on myself. How many of the people are focusing on what's in their own house? That's just a challenge to me, by the way. I'm not going to beat up on everybody else. See, I'm very good at looking at the debts that everybody else owes. Very shocking at looking at mine. Now, I've been a Christian long enough to know that my debt is paid in full. Now, I've been a Christian long enough to know that if I try to have a look at my account balance next to Mr. Swanbury, what do you reckon it's going to look like? Which one do you think he's going to sit there and say he's got the biggest debt out of me and Tony? Remember what I've just told you? What's Jesus going to say? I freely forgave both of you. There is no debt amount. One of the things I'm struggling to understand right now for myself is if Jesus is saying to us there's no debt, why are we holding debts? Why are we still holding on to wrongdoings? Why are we still holding on to the things of the past when Jesus is trying to say, I've freely forgiven you all? Oh, now I'm going to be a little bit interjecting on myself right now. Oh, see, I understand something. See, that woman, what do you reckon she's gone through? Why do you reckon she's got tears pouring out of her eyes and she's wiping his feet with her hair? You reckon she's got a lot going on? Yeah? I reckon she's got a lot. So I'm going to say this to people that have been in abusive relationships. I'm going to say this to people that have been abused physically, mentally, spiritually. Sometimes you just need to keep washing his feet for a while. 
Don't worry about what's going on around you. Just keep washing his feet. Just keep coming to him with love. Because there are things in our life that cannot be just dealt with with a click of a finger. All clear on that? There's a reason when Peter went to Jesus, he said, how many times do I have to forgive? Seven. And Jesus answered Peter and said, surely I say to you, 70 times seven. See, there are things in our life that we can let go of easily. Would you all agree with that? And have you noticed I'm not talking about roundabouts and people cutting me off much anymore? I'm trying to behave myself. You notice I'm not talking about Victorian drivers because there is none. <laughs> <laughs> that will change again when the board is open. <laughs> so, so for me, there's some things that I'm able to cope with pretty easily. There's other things in my life that I'm discovering right now. I've got to stop looking at the Pharisees in the room. I've got to stop looking at who's gathered around me and I've got to start looking at the feet of Jesus and I've got to stay there. Because while ever I look on him, Love and empathy remains. The moment I stop looking at him, what comes with it, do you think? Debts start rising again. What people have done starts rising again. I start saying, who's more, who's more debted than another? I start looking at the TV and I start thinking, you've got to be kidding me. While these are all running around throwing stones at everybody, do you realise that some can come back? I like this, it says here, intermittently. In other words, how long do you reckon this conversation's been going on? I took this up with God. Do you reckon this is, it's taken me 30 seconds to read it to you. How long do you reckon this meal took? Think about eating. I reckon this could have gone on for at least an hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours. What do you think? Yeah? Remember, she's got in. Somehow she's got to him. She's washing his feet. This is going on intermittently for a while, and Simon's having a breakdown. Let's go to the next one, please, Andrew. I can't remember how many scriptures I've got. You did not anoint my head with cheap, ordinary oil. <laughs> what does oil represent? Holy Spirit. <laughs> Let's have a look at this. You did not anoint my head with cheap, ordinary oil, but she has anointed my feet with costly, rare perfume. Let me show you what God was showing me about the oil here. You didn't even come up to me with any love. Oil, Holy Spirit. You did not even come near me even with just the love of a brother, even just out of respect, even just out of courtesy. You know how we say good day, we do this, we do that. I watch some of these kids at school when you first walk up to them, the first thing you get told is how you can go and jump off a lake and how quick you can do it. Is that right, aren't we? I don't think I'm an orphan on that one. And then I sit there and I go, that's pretty cheap. <laughs> True? And God says to me, well now I want you to do what the woman did. I want you to take your most expensive perfume and I want you to wash them. You know what my most expensive perfume is? My compassion, my kindness, my gentleness, because that's the thing that's worth so much to Jesus. Not my religion, not my associations, not my judgments. He said to Simon, Simon, you didn't even put cheap oil on me. You didn't even do the basics of courtesy. You didn't even say, you want me just to wash your hands before you come in? She's come in with the most expensive oil of all. Let me tell you what the most expensive oil of all in your life to be able to keep no debts is you must love. Love who? Cheryl said something earlier to me this morning as we were doing some ministry this week and she said, love the sinner. What's the rest of the sentence? Don't have to love the sin, but you must love the sinner to be able to look past the sin. Yeah? Simon did not demonstrate to Jesus love for the sinner. He focused on the sin. If only you knew what sort of woman was touching him. Jesus has come along and said, Simon, 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 how about if I just focus on the sinner while you focus on the sin? Did you notice Jesus never pushed her away? Jesus never said go. Jesus allowed, allowed her to touch him. How many of us are allowing Christ to touch us? Again, last week we talked about washing your feet, yeah? 
I thought it was impressive of God when he showed me just what this oil represents in my life. When he said, the greatest thing you have, Fred, that I have given you is love for me. Take my love that I have for you. No debts. And give them that perfume. Give to them the worst amongst you. You know, walking into the school with these boys, you know, it was funny because when I first started off, I just looked at the, what they were doing. I go, man, where's your respect? Where's this? Where's that? I could have slapped a lot of them. Can I tell you, Annette and I are going away uh, tomorrow for a couple, for a night, and I was thinking about coming back on Wednesday. Can I show you what's happening inside of me? Just to give you a quick testimony. I started wrestling inside. Do I want to spend two nights with my wife or do I want to get back to these boys at school? And I tell you I'm coming back because I want to get to these boys at school. There you go. That's going to sound really out there, isn't it? Isn't it? Let me show you something. I have a wonderful wife who loves me. I have a wonderful wife who has no debt. My wife is saved. Yeah? These boys? What have they got? Let me show you something. I was with Maury Thompson, the late Maury Thompson, one day. And my daughter was in Teen Challenge and he said to me, and I was going to see him. And I went to Teen Challenge and he didn't turn up for two hours and I was ropeable. Like, how dare you do that? I've come all the way from the Riverland, you know what I mean? And he came in with a big smile on his face. He said, you're pretty ticked off at me, aren't you? And I went, oh, you got no idea. And he walked off. Oh. You already know I'm ticked off. Now you go do that. And he come back to me and I had steam come out of my ears. And I said to him, are you for real? Like, who are you? Like, who do you think you are? And he looked at me and he said, Red, you're saved, aren't you? You've given your life to Jesus. I said, yeah. I said, but then you're okay. You're in the kingdom. I've got people that aren't. They're more important than you. So I'm like, did you hear that? Oh, now people are going to sit back and say, well, hang on a minute, what about traditions and everything? You know, when you come into the house, don't you think you should be invited in? You know what Murray was trying to say to me? Murray was trying to say, I can leave you right now. You're okay. I don't have to rescue you from darkness. But I got one's perishing. So before you judge me harshly on the statement to my wife, my wife is safe in the kingdom of God. My wife has given her, Lord, her life to Jesus. She loves me greatly. Can I tell you that I've got a son who's lost? Do you think I want to see other people's sons lost? Think what I've just said. To me, I'm not sacrificing anything because you all, before you all get ticked off, she's already booked the tickets to go to Queensland to see the granddaughter and she ain't bothering about me. <laughs> so I'll, I'll swap the equation. <laughs> Let's go to the next one, please. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, many as they are. Did you notice Jesus didn't hide from that? Did you notice that? Do you think that you're so smart like me that we can go up and say, hey, Jesus, do you see how bad they are? That's what Simon said to him. Oh, funny, he knew. You reckon he knew? What do you reckon? You reckon Jesus don't know who's walking in the door, what they've done and how they're doing it? You think he doesn't know about these boys at school? You think he doesn't know about your family members? What did Reinhard Bonke say to us this morning? I am with you always. Isn't he in the world always? They're his children. Therefore I tell you, her sins, many as they are, have forgiven her because she has loved much. Now hang on a minute. <laughs> hang on a minute. Stop. She's loved much. I thought that we were saying before she was a woman of ill repute. Ill repute. Better get that out, right? I thought we were saying before that she snuck into the building. I thought we were saying before that she got alongside him and started washing his feet and she was crying. I thought we said before that she didn't even know him. All she said was she'd heard of him. How does he respond to her by saying because she loved much? Let me ask you all something. Who do you think he was referring to when he said she loved much? Everybody's a little bit quiet on me. Yeah, because it got me too. You want to know how long I sat there talking to God on this particular topic? And you know what he said to me? Because when she came in, she threw herself at my mercy. She loved me much. Oh, that did my head in. See, she knew she was a sinner. She knew her life was in the doghouse. She knew that her debt was great. She already knew that. Remember, it was Simon that thought his debt was little because he was comparing debts. 
This isn't talking about she loved her life or anything. This is talking about that she loved Jesus so much that she was prepared to go through all the persecution to get to him. She was prepared to be heckled. She was prepared to be laughed at, potentially hurt, just so she could get to him. And what's Jesus' response to her? Her sins are forgiven her. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. You imagine this dude sitting there, right? Here he is, picking on this woman for coming in about, look at how bad she is, and yet Jesus rebukes him by saying, you didn't even show love to me by anointing me with your love. Yet she's come in and gave me all of her love, and now I'm setting her free, and she's forgiven. Where's Simon at in this? Have a look at this conversation taking place. And then I hear what God wanted me to get out of the crutch of the story. The last line is the crutch of the story that Jesus wanted me to get. Can you all read it from there? Last line says what? Mm -hmm. Oh, see, that's where the problem starts. See, Simon didn't think he had much of an account. He thought her account was bigger than his. So his response is, well, I'm not as bad as her. <laughs> I don't need as much as she does. I don't need to anoint Jesus with, his, with oil when he comes in. See, she sits back and says, well, hang on a minute. I know what I am. She doesn't compare herself to Simon. She simply goes to him herself for what she's done. May I ask you all something in this room? And I'm going to ask the question of everybody on YouTube. Which one are you? Do you see yourself as your sins a little compared to the rest of the world? Or do you see yourself as your sin freely paid regardless? What comes out of your heart and your mouth in people and with forgiveness will depend largely on how you see your own death. Oh, there's people that have said to me, I haven't broken the Ten Commandments. And I'm going, wow, well, aren't you pretty cool? Yeah, I've never put an idol, I've never done this, I've never done that. And I said to him, hey, have you ever looked at a woman sideways? What? Well, Jesus changed the goalposts. Jesus said, in your heart. Yeah, so when I go into the school and I look at these boys and I think I could bring their necks, what's Jesus saying to me? You want me to ring yours first, Fred? <laughs> See, here's the thing. I like the idea that my sins are totally forgiven. I love that idea. But I seem to be having it a bit hard to let go of this much of somebody else's. Anybody else got that problem? Honestly, don't put your hand up, it's between you and God. I am going to make a statement, if I may. People that have a religious relationship with Jesus will forget and neglect to anoint him with oil, their own oil, will neglect to wash him, will neglect to let him wash them, and they'll sit down and as soon as somebody else comes near him that does want to be washed, they'll be first to say, get your life right. Because that's what Simon said. Simon said to Jesus in his thoughts, if only he knew what sort of person this is. Can I ask you a question? Do you know that Jesus knows what sort of person you are? Reverse it. You actually realise that, don't you? That he knows your every thought. The Bible says he knows your every hair and it's numbered. The Bible says the length of your days I was listening to something that God was showing me in the scriptures and it did my head in. Do you know the healings that he did on earth were never permanent? They were never eternal? Did you know that? People still died. And I started asking him, so these wondrous moves that you're doing in healings in the Bible... He said, Red, I'm healing them. they got more time to be with me on earth. He said, I'm healing them to show the world the demonstration of my power and who I am, yet they still die. True? You know anybody who's been alive for a couple thousand years? <laughs> I don't. He started showing me something. How about you focus on the one who cancels debts, not what the debt is being carried. Does that make sense? So while we're sitting here count, counting debts, how's your debt looking? Honestly, this ignorance that God is talking to me about, he said to me, Red, 
when I send you back into the school, how do I want you to go back in? And I said to him, Lord, you don't want me to look at their debt. You want me to look at the fact that they are your precious child. That's these boys that are painful. I'm going to say they're painful. But I want you to anoint them in love. And I want you to find their fault. I already know it. Just come before me and anoint them in love. And then I understood something. Did you notice the woman had to go get the perfume? Did you notice that? It says that she brought it with her. Remember he's saying this perfume, this oil, she's done it. She had to get it herself. There are many people, many Christians right now that still have to get this themselves that their debt is paid in full. Many Christians still have to get that the grace of Jesus Christ is the unmerited favour for a world of sinners. We're not to compare, we're not to compete, and we're not to criticise. We are to do what? Love. And love without envy. <clears throat> he who has been forgiven much. If I look around the room, and you've got to answer this yourself, do you think there's worse sinners out there than you? I mean, you can answer this question, or do you think that you're okay with your sin? You're not too bad. You'll either be the 500 or the 50. I want to just end today's sermon with this point of view. One of the things that stood out to me for me is the Bible says that Jesus made the comment that both the debts were cancelled. Do you know the sign of mistake? He just assumed naturally well, the one with the bigger debt is the one that will be the most happiest. Are you happy your debt's cancelled? Are you happy that your, book, your name is written in the book of life? I was reading the story in Luke where it talks about the 70 went out, yeah? And when they come back, they said to Jesus, man, even the demons bow to us. And you'll know his response. Don't rejoice that the demons bow to you. Rejoice that your name is written in the book of life. Maybe some of us, including me, maybe we need to find some more praise and some more thanksgiving in our heart that our name is in the book of life. That our debt has been cancelled in full. Instead of worrying about who else's has been cancelled. I'm not saying it's easy. You heard me say easy earlier. There's things that people go through that are difficult. But I want to say this to you. If you're willing to stay at the feet of Jesus. If you're willing to let your tears. Let your hair. If you've got some. <laughs> wash his feet. If you're willing to stay there. No matter what's going on around you. If you're willing to seek that oil for yourself, that love for yourself, I want to make a promise to you today. It might take a while, but I promise you it will happen. If you're willing, He is able. Some hurts are deeper than others. But let me show you what I'm seeing at the moment around our world. I am not seeing love being demonstrated. All I am seeing is hate. All I'm seeing is people measuring each other's debts. And can I tell you, none of us going to mean anything when you stand standing before God. I'm sorry if that's offensive. But I want to say this to us as Christians. God has called us to speak on injustices. He has not called us to speak on debts. You all get that? He has called us to be set apart, to be holy like he is holy, to stay out of civilian affairs and to speak on injustices. We are not to get involved in debts because our debt has been paid in full. Maybe we need to go and take a blank check. To some people, what do you think? And she said, just sign the dollar amount, mate, you paid in full. You did just close your eyes, yeah? So I know when I was talking to God, uh, so they're telling me that this COVID-19 stuff, I'm not allowed to lay hands on people, I'm not allowed to do this and do that, you know how hard that is. So what we're going to do is, I know when God was speaking to me, he said to me that there are still people in here holding debts. And you know if that's you, you don't need anybody to come along and you know, be a prophet and tear it out in the open. You know yourself if you're still seeing other people as worse than you. You know. 
If you're still looking at family members and going through, have a look at you. May I say to you, while you're pointing one finger forward, there's three pointing back. I'm not sure we'll do that again the day. That was deadly. We're going to do this, all right? Because I believe we prayed this morning, didn't we, Jenny? We prayed for healing to break out in this place today. That's what we prayed for. So there's people in here with physical healing required. There's people in here with spiritual healing required. There's also people in here that have emotional healing that needs to be dealt with today. I stand before you with a debt that's been paid in full. And though my sins were red like scarlet, he has made them white as snow. That applies to every person on the planet that calls on his name, regardless of how big the debt is. I'm going to get you to do me a favour. I want you to keep your eyes closed because you're not doing this for me. But I believe there's some people here, if you're willing, just to put your hand up and say, that's me, Lord. I'm still keeping a record of debts. If you're willing to do it, I'm going to show you what I believe God is about to do. So if that's you, just put your hand up. If you know, beyond all doubt, you know, don't go looking in your closet trying to find skeletons. I'm not asking you to do that. But I'm going to say, out of the hands that are going up, there's some physical sickness present out of this conversation. Out of all the hands that have gone up, there's some spiritual sickness that needs to be dealt with today. And there's some physical, uh, what did I say, emotional sickness. You can all put your hands down. This is between you and God. I want you to remember this. This is not between anybody else. You know, when Jesus spoke to Simon, guess, let me show you something. Simon was listening, but so was the woman. She heard him say it. Both debts are paid. So if you put your hands up, I want you to pray and repeat after me with your eyes closed. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner saved by grace. Your unmerited favour has cancelled my debt. Though my sins were red like scarlet, you've made them white as snow. Lord Jesus, I ask you right now to anoint me with that love, that expensive perfume of yours. I call on it right now to fall on me, to heal me of my ailment. So right now, if that's physical, I want you to say physical. If that's spiritual, I want you to say spiritual. And if it's emotional, so if you're having trouble forgiving people, that's emotionally, okay? If you know you've got some issues in your health and you're trying to work out where it's coming from, I want you to pray for physical healing. And if you're still struggling to understand that your debt's free, then I want you to pray spiritual healing. So there you go, you can all just say it yourself. So for me, I need the Lord to heal me spiritually. Because he's exposed in my heart that those boys in school, I'm still judging them with a debt. I'm looking at their debts, not Jesus. Okay, all eyes closed. I want you to do me a favour. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, heal me right now. All right, Father, fall on them right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. They've testified, not me. They've called on your name, not me. For them. Father, right now, I want you to put your hand up. If you know he's just touched you in whatever area, spiritually, physically, if you know your sins have just been forgiven in full, and that's the first time you feel it, put your hand right up so I can see. Yeah, one, two, three, four. Yeah, put your hands down. If you know that you've been struggling with forgiving somebody else in your emotions and you know that just broke, put your hand up. Yep. Yep, there's a couple of hands going up. You beauty. Okay, now here comes the one that I want to see. Some of you have had physical ailments because of this. I want you to do something that your physical ailment that you know means it was there. Whatever it is. Now, let's go for a walk, go for a walk, shake your head, stand up, do, a, do the, I don't know, hillbilly shuffle, whatever. Do whatever it is because I believe that God said he was going to heal physically today. Now, I don't know, but you'll know if just that confession has healed your physical ailment. Is there anybody that knows that physically they've just been healed? 
with their testimony, confession. You know, I know the power of God has just fallen on a couple of people in here. And you're going to be struggling to keep tears back right now. You're going to be struggling because he's just come in with that love, that anointing that only he can bring. And I'm going to tell you, let the tears out. Let him set you free. Don't hide. If you know what's in there, let it out. Anybody with the physical? Yeah, I can see a couple of hands going up. Yeah, anybody else? That you know right now, because of that confession, Christ has healed you. There's a couple of people in here that have breathing issues. I want you to take a deep breath and breathe out. For those who have breathing issues that said that prayer, look at me. I want you to look at me, so I'll look around the room and I want you to tell me, are you breathing better? Is that you? Are you breathing better? Oh, hallelujah. Forgiveness is an incredible thing. Anybody else? Who else had the breathing? Ah, oh, it's time for us to get some spiritual gifts moving again. What do you think? I think it's time for the power of God to be demonstrated amongst His people. First, begin with me, Lord. Start demonstrating it in my life. I'm not talking about ministry. I'm talking about in me. Breathing better? Isn't that pretty cool? Who else had that? Breathing better? Yeah? Amazing when we just call out to God to wash us of whatever it is. Jesus said, I've come to set the captives free. If you're captive to something, you're not free. All right, everybody can open their eyes if you haven't already. I'm trusting God touched everybody in the room, not just those who put his hand up. So if you know, we're going to, I don't know what we're going to do, we'll think of something. If you know that God has just touched you, whatever's wrong, Whatever in your heart, don't care. I don't want to know. I just want you to stand up. I want you to acknowledge that he's touched you this morning. I want you to give him the praise by standing in front of him. Yeah? Let's stand before our king and let's tell our king how grateful we are. Let's wash his feet now. Let's praise him and say, thank you, Lord, for saving me, healing me, restoring me, whatever it is. Let's just thank him, yeah? So where you go, you just thank him. Praise him out loud. Don't worry about the person next to you. You want to pray in tongues to praise him? Pray. Thank you, Lord, that you love me. I thank you, Lord, that my debt is paid in full. And I thank you, Lord, that you've wiped the slate clean in my eyes for other people that I'm no longer to look at the debt. I'm to look at the blank check with your name on it for them. Father, help me love them as you have loved me. An everlasting love. A love of sacrifice. A love of obedience. But above all, a love of love. Let that richness of love, that anointing, fall on me, Lord, that I may take every day with me. Every day with me in that love. Now, Andrew, maybe you can find a song for me. You got that one covered for me? I don't know what you're doing up the back. You'll take care of it. For the rest of you, here's an opportunity to praise him, yeah? I've just watched some of you stand up saying, this has happened this morning. Have you noticed no man's involved? Christ wants to set you free. Everybody can stand up, as everybody now. You don't have to, obviously, but I'm going to encourage you to. We're going to switch the lights off and Andrew's going to play us over. We're going to finish with that. So this morning, if you've got something to praise him with, <laughs> let's praise him. Right now, I think we all have those of us that have just stood. So get a feet are moving. Get your hands are clapping. That's it, Marilyn, I like it. Let's just praise him and say, thank you, Lord, for setting me free. And lunchtime. Good job.